A ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Hello! And welcome to SLU, where there is literally space for everyone. I'm Paul Cox, and tonight we're exploring the mega beaver full moon, live through SLU's telescopes. We partnered with our friends at the Old Farmer's Almanac to bring you a pack show uh, to learn more about this particular full moon. Now, coming up on the show, we'll be welcoming two very special guests tonight. First of all, I'll be joined by a favourite guest of SLU members, Bob Berman, uh, to discuss what makes this a mega moon. That's right, you've heard it here first. This is a mega moon. This is not a super moon. It's a mega moon. And we'll be asking Bob why this is the closest and brightest full moon in nearly 70 years. This really is a special night. Uh, are these events linked to earthquakes? We're going to be answering that question as well because we've obviously uh, heard the news this weekend of that massive earthquake in New Zealand. And it's quite often talked about, you know, these mega moons, super moons being linked to earthquakes. So we're going to be talking about that as well. And we're not suggesting this, but do super or mega moons affect human behavior like voting behavior, perhaps? I don't know. And we are also going to tell you the best way of viewing the mega beaver moon tonight and tomorrow night for yourself if you've got clear skies. And then a little bit later, I'm going to be joined by Janice Stillman. Now, Janice is the editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, um, and she's going to be telling us uh, why this particular full moon is called the beaver moon and who gave it that particular name. Now, of course, the stars of the show are our live telescope feeds. Now, I was meant to be broadcasting uh, live uh, from our Canary Islands Observatory at the Institute of Astrophysics in the Canary Islands. That's a few hundred miles off the west coast of Africa, high on a volcano. But I had to fly back to England earlier this evening, um, so I had the bonus of actually watching the mega beaver moon rising over the horizon from 35,000 feet. For some reason, this particular photo that I took outside of the window is upside down. I'm not sure my airliner was really doing the kind of aerobatics that I like, but uh, it was a glorious, glorious sight. But we've got a whole stack of live feeds for you tonight. So let's take a quick look back at the one we saw before. This is our panorama. Now, this panorama image is of our Canary Islands uh, observatory, and it looks like daylight there. You can see the skies are blue, and there's a few clouds around. That's actually the nighttime view. That is the view as it is now. The moon is so bright tonight, and we'll discuss this a little bit later as well. It's actually illuminating uh, the whole scene there, and a lot of the observatories are closed there because we've had some pretty high humidity. Uh, but we've also got this special camera set up on Pico del Tello. This is a huge volcanic cone, about 10,000 feet in altitude. And if we take a look at that at the moment, it's really obscured because there are some clouds. You can see actually in the bottom right-hand side, that little uh, triangle below the, the clouds there, that is Pico del Tello, the volcanic cone. Um, and that is in the cloud. But we had a, a glorious, glorious sight in there earlier on today. Look at this. This is a time lapse. There you see it on the horizon, right in the middle. That is the mega beaver moon rising above the horizon. Still just as the sun's setting, because we're at such a high altitude here, we actually see below zero altitude. So the sun was still up and then the full moon was rising. That was a terrific sight. Look at that. I mean, actually no photograph ever really does justice uh, to these full moons, and you really need to see them while they're rising. We've also got tonight um, our all-sky camera. Now, this is a special camera that SLU members use when they're controlling the telescopes. They've got a mighty half-meter telescope up there that they control. This is the camera that they use to monitor sky conditions. Now, what we can see here is a full 180-degree fisheye view of the whole sky. That fuzzy patch in the middle, there's actually a little bit of condensation because of the humidity. But behind that little bit of condensation is that full beaver moon right there in that image. So conditions are looking pretty good. So without further ado, let's have our first glimpse through the telescopes of 
the mega beaver moon. And this is our wide field telescope. Now this is, uh, has a huge field of view. And there we can see, oh, isn't that beautiful? Absolutely beautiful, beautiful image. We were so worried we had some cloud there earlier on this evening, but there it is. There is the mega beaver moon live from SLU's observatory in the Canary Islands. Looking pretty cool. We're gonna go back to that uh, throughout the night, but we haven't just got one observatory. We've got a second observatory so that SLU members can control telescopes, have a look to see what's down in the Southern Hemisphere. So we should have now our Chile telescopes uh, online as well. And here we can, oh, this is the first time I've seen this this evening. What a spectacular view. Um, I was about to say, this is our one of our high magnification telescopes, so the whole moon doesn't fit wholly within the field of view, especially a mega moon, because it's a lot larger. And we'll see that a little bit later on as well. But look at that. Is that a cracking image of this mega beaver moon or what? I'm sorry, I get distracted very easily. I'm like a, a child with sweets. Oh, nice image. That is gorgeous. That's coming straight in live from the Chile Observatory. Now, I, I'm digressing there because I got caught up by the, um, the pretty picture. Uh, coming up, what have we got coming up then in this show? We're gonna take a really quick commercial break, but when we return, I'll be joined by our first guest, author, journalist, and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. He's gonna help us to understand what circumstances have come together tonight and tomorrow night to make this the largest mega moon for nearly 70 years years. And then a little bit later, I'll be talking to Janice Stillman, editor of the Old Farmers Almanac, to find out why this particular full moon, this November full moon, became known as the Beaver Moon to some tribes in North America. Uh, and if you have any questions for me or my guests tonight, you can send them to at SLU on Twitter, or you can use the live chat uh, next to this video on the live channel if you're watching at slu.com. And actually, we've already had a handful of uh, tweets coming in from you folks. We've got uh, Sylvia Salceras uh, sent in this lovely, lovely picture of the mega beaver moon. So please, if you've been taking images of the mega beaver moon, please tweet them to us and uh, we'll try and get them into the show if we can. Um, that is a great image, Sylvia. And if you want to photograph it yourself, just like Sylvia's done, We'll tell you how to do that a little bit later. And uh, we've also got a nice hello from TV host and model Daisy Ferentis, uh, who's very excited about tonight's Mega Beaver Moon, just as I am. So uh, thank you very much for that shout out, Daisy. I hope you enjoy the show. And you for this show, uh, you can also join the live chat on Facebook Live and share the video with your friends and family. So please spread the word. We've got 25 minutes of some absolutely cracking live streams coming in of this mega beaver moon. We're going to be right back after this short commercial break with uh, still astronomer Bob Berman. Technology partners there, Celestron uh, SLU members will know I'm a bit of a fan of uh, Celestron equipment. We've been uh, using them for 13 years. You know, it's our 14th anniversary this year. Look at this lovely live stream coming in of the Mega Beaver Moon from Chile's High Magnification Telescope down in Chile. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Anyway, welcome back to our live show here at SLU where there really is space for everyone. I'm Paul Cox and tonight we're talking about that, the Mega Beaver Moon. I'm delighted to welcome author, journalist, and astronomy editor for the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman, to the show. Bob, welcome. Thank you, Paul. Good to be here. Now, I understand you're actually giving a, a, a talk somewhere about this particular supermoon. So let's just start by answering that question, Bob. And I know we've been calling it a mega moon, but let's answer the question about a supermoon. What is a supermoon? Well, uh, the last few years, it's come to mean a moon that's unusually close to us. In 
Uh, as the moon goes around Earth, its orbit is not round, it's a stretched out ellipse. So once a month, it's closer than at other times. And once a year, it's particularly close. And once every number of years, it gets really, wow, super close, and that's what's happening. Now, you know, I was asking that question about supermoon versus megamoon, because we're not great fans of how that term supermoon has kind of been spread out. Uh, for example, this is the middle of three consecutive monthly supermoons. And I had to say that, you know, I asked on Twitter, what's so super about something that happens in three consecutive nights? And that's why we've chosen here at SLU to celebrate just the largest full moon in any given year. And to differentiate that, that's why we've dubbed this the mega moon. But if this is the largest full moon for nearly 70 years, Bob, what set of circumstances uh, have had to come together to, to make this the, the largest full moon in 70 years? It's a great question, and it's certainly, <laughs> we have a sold out national landmark uh, here of people just to see it. It just shows what the excitement is. See this big empty place? This is gonna be <laughs> packed with people in just half an hour or so. This place is actually sold out. We have telescopes and binoculars set up for it, so it just shows the excitement over it. So what came together to produce this? Well, um, if the moon falls at the same time when it's coming close, if it also is going to be full, that stretches out its orbit unless it gets a little closer. But if we are near the sun at that time and we are, our planet Earth is at its closest point to the sun the first week of January every year, so we're only eight weeks from that right now, then the sun gets into the scene and pulls along with the Earth on the moon's orbit. Now, it changes the very shape of the moon's orbit and lets those close approaches or perigees get even closer than they normally come. And that's why we've got the very closest one since 1948. Wow, that's very unusual. It is, and very much worth celebrating, and I think very worthy of you know, being called a mega moon. Now, Bob, I'm not sure if you can see it on your screen, but we've got this uh, comparison image up between a, a mini or micro moon and this mega moon. Um, because you see an awful lot of, I have to say, it tends to be astronomers on the internet saying, oh, there's nothing different about all of this. What's all the big fuss? And we're not suggesting that when you look in the sky, you will particularly notice that it's a lot larger than normal because you've got nothing to compare it to. But here are images that SLU members have taken through the SLU telescopes comparing this mini moon when it's at its smallest and when it's at its largest. I mean, there is very definitely a big difference between the two of those, isn't there? You're so right, Paul. If we could only have the moon at its smallest of the year, at its apogee, <laughs> and, and the moon at its perigee in the sky together, then nobody would question it. But without yeah. seeing that, all we can say that t is tonight, the moon is only 7% larger than average. So yeah. are you going to notice a 7% larger than the average full moon? Not, not honestly speaking, no. Everybody who goes out and looks at it will say, mm, I don't know, I'm not sure, I'm not mm. sure I see anything. Nonetheless, it's not really hype when the moon is only 216,000 miles away, surface to surface, and it has not come this close since 1948. We, we didn't make this up, so that, that, that's a reality. Put, put another way, with a 100-power telescope, the moon appears only one moon width away from us. And Paul, you're gonna really like this a lot. You know mm -hmm. that the moon's diameter is 2,160 miles, Yep. Um, 2160 are those digits. And you know that it's distance from us, surface to surface, tonight, uh, actually in the wee hours of Monday morning, will be um, only uh, 216,000. Same digits. So in other words, wow. tonight, the moon is exactly 100 moon widths away from us. And that's rare. Only we can 100 always, moon widths from we can, us. Always rely on you, Bob, to, to give us that interesting fact that nobody else has ever come up with. Now, um, watch it. before we take a, a very quick break, Bob, have a look at this live image stream coming in from the Chile High Magnification Telescope. At the beginning of the show, my jaw nearly hit my lap. I mean, this is an astounding image tonight, isn't it? 
It really is, because even though we have the capability of blowing up the moon to any size we want, I think um, what we're seeing is that even using our widest field, lowest magnification view, the moon still manages to crowd the field of view so that we can barely fit the whole thing in. Yeah, super. Now, Bob, you're going to join me again in a few minutes' time so we can discuss whether this mega moon uh, has an effect on tides and possibly whether there is any link to the moon's proximity in earthquakes like the one that struck New Zealand okay. uh, last Great. night. Um, so we'll see you uh, back very, very soon. Okay, very good. Now, we're going to take a very quick commercial break, but first I wanted to tell you about a special broadcast we have coming up later this week. On the 16th of November, we're sitting back in our garden chairs for a night of meteor watching for the Leonid meteor shower. Join us at 8 p.m. Eastern time, that's 1 a.m. Uh, for Western Europe. And we're going to explain there how you can photograph meteors from your own garden or backyard. And we'll even show you how we can listen to meteors as uh, well as seeing them whiz across our skies in all of our live feeds. So as we uh, take this look at this live image coming in from the Canary Islands Observatory, SLU's Canary Islands Observatory at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands, how cool is that? We have got more mega beaver moon right after this break. Hi, everybody. I'm Gerard Montu. Now, you might know me by my former stage name, Bill Patrick, from my days with ESPN and NBC Sports. But now I'm the expedition leader here at SLU, and I'm ready for us to explore the universe together. I'm absolutely thrilled to be a part of this endeavor, believe me. In fact, I'm just one of many new additions coming to SLU as we celebrate our 13th anniversary. So stay tuned as we roll out a brand new website, new telescopes, and many other surprises we have in store for you. When a magical moment happens in space, I'll be here with our team of experts covering it live. And I know you'll want to be here too. So join us as we explore the stars together here at SLU, space for everyone. A great addition to uh, the SLU team there. We're looking forward to, uh, to that. Anyway, welcome back to our live broadcast of the Mega Beaver Moon here at SLU, where as he just said, there really is space for everyone. Now, I'm Paul Cox, and I'm here with author, journalist, and astronomy editor for the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. Hi, Bob. Hi, Paul. Now, you showed us all of those empty chairs. I know what's happening here, Bob. Um, they're all at home watching our show now before they all pile off down to uh, your auditorium <laughs> and, and, and fill that. Well, just before the break, we were talking, I was talking about... Um, a lot of astronomers kind of getting a little bit, um, I think, pompous about, oh, what's the difference on these things? But I think we've, we're, bo we're proving in both of these events tonight just how important they are. You're going to be filling an auditorium full of people because of the mega moon tonight. Yep. And it's a way to engage of this people and interest to look at this people. Post, that's exactly. for sure. Um, yeah, 267 people, I've just been told, and they're all coming here just because of the mega moon. That's right. So exactly. it, it, so it's exciting, the public. And even if people looking up at the sky are not going to see that cartoon like huge moon filling the sky, it doesn't take away from the fact that the tides are being affected. This is an area that does get tides. Um, and they're going to be uh, super high and super low tomorrow, and especially the day after, because tides usually take one day to catch up to the moon. And uh, so this really affects us. It's not just some abstraction, some uh, conceptual astronomical thing. There really is a link between uh, this astronomical event and our everyday lives. And these tidal differences that we're going to see over the next couple of days, Bob, are they also influenced by the Earth-Moon system being closer to the sun around this time of year, or does that not have any impact? Oh, it really does. I mean, the, the greatest influence is always the lineup of the sun, the moon, and the Earth in a straight line or syzygy. 
That's what causes the spring tide. Everybody imagines it must have something to do with the spring season, but it doesn't. It's as if the yeah. tides spring out of us, spring. or uh, it's like a spring of water reaching out to us. But the secondary effect is, yes, if the moon is closer to us, uh, even though tidal effects fall off inversely with the square of distance, I'm sorry, gravity falls off inversely with the square of distance, but tides vary with the cube of distance. So when you get a closer moon, it's the cube of its distance that affects the tidal pull, and uh, that means it's a huge effect on us. Right. Now, there have been suggestions, and I, I have to say, you often see these on conspiracy websites, um, but that there was a paper that came out earlier on this year from the, I think it was the Paris University, which is linking these close moons, these close full moons with earthquakes. And of course, we've seen a huge earthquake hit New Zealand uh, just last night. Is the jury still out on this, Bob? Or, or are there any links between these moon events and earthquakes? Because kind of logically, it feels right, doesn't it? It does feel right. Uh, actual studies have shown that the tidal effect on Earth is enough to bulge, to bulge the solid Earth. It's not just the oceans that move an average of three feet. The solid mass of Earth itself moves somewhere between eight and 12 inches. Now, that's not huge, but if an earthquake's right on the edge of happening, uh, even mm. though the tidal forces are only one two thousandth of the torque found in crustal rock, it can certainly be enough to supply that last final straw. So, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back because uh, studies show that statistically there are more earthquakes at the time mm -hmm. of great tidal uh, stresses, like now, like today and tomorrow, than should mm -hmm. be expected by chance. Yeah, and uh, I, I think what's disappointed me most uh, um, from the scientific community where, when this has been raised in, in just the last few decades really is, the immediate reaction is, no, don't be silly, uh, you're being conspiracy theorists. But you know, now there is more and more um, evidence, and as you say, statistics, which are actually supporting this. So uh, our, 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 our thoughts go out to those folks down in New Zealand. I've got uh, some, some people down there myself. Now, Bob, the other last question I've got for you tonight is, is there any proof that full moons affect human behavior. Could they have had any vote on the USA elections last week? <laughs> the USA elections, uh, I doubt it because we weren't even any, in any particular phase or title uh, position last Tuesday. However, studies looking at crime rates, birth rates, uh, mental health, for example, calls to crisis centers, calls um, admissions to uh, mental hospitals, this kind of thing, have been done for decades now, and the res results have generally been negative. I can't say that there haven't been right. some interesting positive results. For example, a pair of doctors, a father and son manager and manager in the 1950s, found an increase in births, not for the full moon, but for the uh, period, the half month period when the moon was full. Now, that, that's when the tides are, are, are greater. Uh, surveys of mental hospital calls to crisis centers, admissions to mental hospitals, those have been more all over the place. And so you'd have to say, if you looked at this honestly, you can't firmly link the moon to most human behaviors. You certainly can link it to animal behaviors because oh. there's an awful lot of creatures that follow the tides, especially in the intertidal zones where the mm -hmm. tides really go in and out and expose great areas of uh, saltwater marshes and their predators like gulls that uh, very much uh, live uh, uh, and respond and breed in tune with the, uh, the tidal rhythms of Earth, including the uh, bi-weekly tidal rhythm of the spring tides versus the neap tides. All right. Now, um, we're running a little bit short of time here, Bob, but one thing we haven't mentioned, and it's very you know, uh, appropriate to, to discuss after you've, you've talked about animal behavior around these full tides, they're not really reacting are they to I mean turtles they're not reacting to the tide being full they're reacting to the increased brightness aren't they of a full moon and this mega moon is even brighter than most full moons isn't it absolutely right because even though the moon is only 11 percent uh, I'm sorry seven percent larger than average 
nonetheless, it has a greater area. Uh, area, as you know, varies. You, we remember from uh, mm. uh, high school uh, math uh, that you're talking about uh, pi r squared for the area of a uh, circle and or 2 pi r. In other words, it's not just a linear relationship. It's much greater than that. So there's more moon area. And then a stronger sunlight is hitting the moon right now because the moon being closer to Earth also affects that intensity and that varies inversely with the square of distance. So that produces about a 30% boost in brightness. So even though there's only a, a small 7% boost in diameter of the moon tonight compared with average or a 14% boost between the smallest versus largest moons, it's more like a 30% boost in, in its brightness and in its tidal effect. So these are, these are real effects. And we can see it in this comparison image. Once again, these are images previously that we've taken, SLU members have taken with the telescopes of a micro moon when the moon is very far away from Earth and then one of these super moons as well. And we can see just, you know, exactly what you were saying there, Bob. The increased area is, is really quite massive. By the way, as far as human behavior is concerned, we did do a survey this year. We've been covering um, full moons every single month this year. And we did a survey of SLU staff. And apparently, the day after full moons, we're always a little bit more tired than we are on a normal day. And I'm not sure whether that has to do with the fact that we've stayed up broadcasting until the early hours of the morning, maybe. I would, I'd suspect that has something to do with it. But around here, the tides are going to be amazing on Monday, and especially on Tuesday. The tides usually take one day to respond to the moon. So the maximum lunar effect, the moon will be closest between 6 and 6.30 Eastern time. Um, in other words, the wee hours of the night, people in the United States will actually see the moon still in the sky uh, as it reaches its closest point. And then the strongest yeah. tidal effect will be one day after that. So it's still to come. We still have it in front of us. Bob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Now, your talk tonight that you're giving, your presentation tonight, are there any seats left there if people want to come along to that? Uh, yeah, right now there's plenty of seats. But uh, <laughs> if we uh, tune in again, uh, because this is 9 o'clock Eastern time, the starting time, but uh, it would be interesting to peek in again at, let's say, 9 o'clock or 5 after 9, and uh, there won't be an empty seat. Okay, well, we wish you well for your live event there. Thank you so much for joining us here for our live event, Bob. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. That was Bob Berman, journalist, author, and astronomy editor of the Old Farmers Almanac. Bob's been with SLU uh, since 2003 when we first started off. Great, great friend to SLU. Now, we are going to be right back after this short commercial break with our special guest from the Old Farmers Almanac to discover who named this particular full moon, the Beaver Moon. I interviewed uh, Janice Stillman earlier this week. Welcome back to our mega beaver moon show here at SLU, where there is literally space for everyone. Now, I'm delighted to welcome a regular guest on our full moon shows to tell us why this particular full moon was named the beaver moon. So please welcome editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Janice Stillman, to our show tonight. Janice, thank you so much for joining us and welcome back to SLU for tonight's full moon. Hi, Paul. It's great to be with you. Thank you. So why is this full moon referred to as the beaver moon and who gave it that name? Well, November's full moon was called the beaver moon by both the colonists and the Algonquin Native American tribes because this was the time to set beaver traps before the swamps froze and therefore to ensure a supply of warm winter furs. The idea was to catch the beavers. Well, that kind of makes me a bit sad now. Uh, but uh, I, I live in England and we don't have beavers. In fact, I'm not even sure whether we've ever had beavers in, in the British Isles. Uh, so other than the old nature documentary, I really don't know very much 
about these animals at all. But you've got some fascinating beaver facts for us, haven't you? Yes, I, and I think beavers are typically uh, resident only in North America, so keep that in mind. Okay. But beavers are the second largest rodent in the world behind South America's capybara. Oh. Beavers measure on average 45 inches from their nose to the tip of their usually 12-inch tail. They're vegetarians, they live in fresh water and can be found wherever streams and woody plants are available. Beavers have webbed back feet that make them powerful swimmers, able to swim about five miles per hour, which would be the same as eight kilometers per hour. They're famous for gnawing at trees and branches to build dams and lodges with sticks and mud. But here's a few other things you might not know. Their okay. orange front teeth never stop growing and they're continually sharpened by the gnawing on the wood. Beavers build canals just to move materials from the, the site where they find them to the dam lodge site elsewhere. Right. The biggest right. dam in the world, in fact, is in Canada at the Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta. It is 2,788 feet long. That's about 850 wow. meters. It was first spotted by satellite in 2007 and first visited <laughs> by a man who came from New Jersey in 2014. On a cold day, you can tell if a beaver lodge is occupied if you see steam rising from, from the vent in the roof, the hole in the roof of the lodge. And this is something that's really fascinating. Beavers inspect their homes daily. They clean them by pushing out decaying matter and even clean their bedding, pushing it out, rinsing it and pulling it back in. They're one of the few wow. mammals that will fix up their place if it's not just right. So this is, these are major construction projects and I had no idea actually that beavers were rodents. Um, I mean, the capybara, I'm very familiar with them. They look kind of like giant guinea pigs with longer legs, but I had no idea about beavers being rodents. But you were also telling me actually before, the, before we started uh, the show, there was one beaver family that kind of struck it a bit rich, wasn't there? Yes, this is kind of funny, actually. In 2004, a, 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 some thieves had robbed a casino in Louisiana, and apparently they yeah. got nervous and panicked and threw the money bags that they were carrying into a stream that just happened to be occupied by a family of beavers. Well, the beavers grabbed one bag and put the cash to good use stuffing it into the cracks and holes of their lodge very neatly, <laughs> such that when it was discovered by police, the dollar bills were whole and intact, although wet. So it was a safe recovery, but a damn good story. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I wonder if they really knew. I mean, they just saw it as great kind of filler material, didn't they, for their lovely little nest. But, uh, but back to uh, naming of these full moons then. Uh, this November full moon, um, are there any other names other than the beaver moon that other cultures um, have, have known it by? Well, typically in our experience, we use the Native American names from North America. So it's the, the Native Americans and other indigenous peoples who really observed what was going on around them in nature and in the weather and climate and time. So for example, you've got the full frost moon is another name because mm -hmm. it was the first heavy frost in the area. You've also got the moon when the rivers begin to freeze, again, an indication of what was happening to folks yeah. in that particular part of the country. Snowy mountains in the morning moon, indication, of oh, course, lovely. this is folks who lived in the mountains or high country. And then geese going south moon, because that's when they started to observe the geese flying in the bee formation south, and all an indication that the cold winter was about to come. Wow. I, I love these. I mean, we've talked about it before, but these names, they they were to mark the ebb and flow of times and what better way to do that than the monthly full moon, you know, and, and some of those moon, that some of those names.
Hi, everybody. I'm Gerard Montu. Now, you might know me by my former stage name, Bill Patrick, from my days with ESPN and NBC Sports. But now I'm the expedition leader here at SLU, and I'm ready for us to explore the universe together. I'm absolutely thrilled to be a part of this endeavor, believe me. In fact, I'm just one of many new additions coming to SLU as we celebrate our 13th anniversary. So stay tuned as we roll out a brand new website, new telescopes, and many other surprises we have in store for you. When a magical moment happens in space, I'll be here with our team of experts covering it live. And I know you'll want to be here too. So join us as we explore the stars together here at SLU, space for everyone. We are so looking forward to Gerard coming on board with uh, with SLU. Now, what are we looking at here, you might ask? Well, that is the Mega Beaver Moon, live from SLU's Canary Islands Observatory at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. And this is just one of the many telescopes that SLU members use every single night. Now. What have we learned so far tonight? Well, we've learned uh, what makes this a mega moon, the largest full moon in nearly 70 years. Um, and we've also kind of delved in there with uh, Janice Stillman uh, into the meaning uh, behind the name Beaver Moon. Now, we unfortunately got cut off there, but one of the things that we're going to be doing is asking all of you to come up with your local name for December's full moon. So now's the time to do this. Go out tonight and tomorrow night. See where this full moon is rising in your garden. So one of the um, suggestions that Janice had was, you know, if there's some bare trees and the moon's rising behind that, well, your local name from your backyard for December's full moon might be bare trees full moon. So. Uh, Tweet those to us, to Atsu, because we're interested in uh, seeing all of those. Now, we have just got coming up here the live stream coming in from SLU's Chile Observatory, where we've also got telescopes that SLU members use every night. And frankly, these views tonight from Chile have just knocked my socks off. The contrast that you get here um, is really quite unusual for a full moon. And we'll tell you about that in a little, little, bit, uh, little bit of time. But we've also had uh, Pete Haverly. He's in Mauna Kea, Hawaii. And he's taken this beautiful image. And this looks like it's just rising, the mega beaver moon over Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Thank you very much, Pete, uh, for sending those. Uh, if anybody else is taking their own images of the Mega Beaver Moon tonight or tomorrow night, please tweet them to at SLU and uh, we'll either share them during the show now or in one of our shows coming up. And we have had quite a few questions from viewers tonight interested in either viewing or maybe photographing this mega moon and the moon in general. Uh, and the first question was, what's the best way to view the mega or full moon? Well, I always recommend that you watch a full moon as it rises. You get the full effect um, of what's called the moon illusion. And this is actually where, when you see the moon in relationship to either horizon or buildings or anything else, just like this, um, it always looks bigger than it does if you're just looking up in the sky and see it in isolation. Now, this is my very, very most favorite, sorry about the grammar there, um, image of a supermoon. This is from Daniel Lopez, uh, the Institute of Astrophysics at the Canary Islands. And people have also been asking us, how do you photograph a moon? Um, and this is the way, right? Now, it's best to have a long focal lens or even a telescope with a DSLR camera. And what Daniel used here is he's about a mile or two miles away from those white towers. Those white towers are actually solar telescopes. We've got a solar telescope also at the Canary Islands Observatory. And those people are halfway between him and the observatory. And he's using his DSLR camera on the back of a telescope and it foreshortens all of that. And that's what gives you this huge scale of the moon. And this was, uh, this was moon set, I think, 
Uh, no, sorry, that's Moon Rise. That was a super moon rise over the Canary Islands Observatory, I think, last year. So a long focal lens, if you can. But, you know, there's another way of doing it as well. If you've got a pair of binoculars um, or a small telescope, it doesn't matter what size it is. It can be almost a toy telescope. Just get your smartphone. Put the camera up to the eyepiece, even the eyepiece of binoculars. You've got to hold it really, really steady and snap a picture. And sometimes you'll need to set the manual on your smartphone uh, manually, the focus on your smartphone manually. Um, to get it in focus. But what you're doing there is something called afocal photography. And that's really cool. So you're, what you're really doing there is you're taking a photo of what your eye would normally see through the binoculars or the telescope. So that's another good way. But always, always try and take an image of the moon with something else in the composition. It's no different. Astrophotography is no different to any other kind of photography, uh, especially when you're talking about wide field stuff with a DSLR camera. Compose your image, your photograph, um, usually with a lovely building or something like that. And if you use a long lens and go a long way away from the building, have the moon in the background, and then you'll get this absolutely mega sized moon as well. Do you need any special training or knowledge was the other question. No, just go with the auto settings to start with on your camera. You can also try uh, the sunset preset if your camera has got one of those. And then the last question here, was when is the best time to photograph the moon? And as you can see here, and, and this is what I was talking about with this um, image stream coming in from the Chile High Magnification Telescope, full moon actually isn't the best time to photograph a moon through a telescope because it's fully illuminated, so you get no shadow. Uh, so the best times are the lesser phases, say a quarter phase or one of the crescent phases. And the, the area that you want to focus in on is the terminator. It's that region between the lit and unlit portion of the moon. And it casts shadows. The sun is casting shadows over mountain ranges, over valleys, over craters. And sometimes some craters have a little mountain right in the center of them where the object impacted and the, the ground came back up and that will cast shadows if you catch it just at the right time. There are actually some, uh, some specific phenomena on the moon that those shadows cause. One of them is called the lunar X, which is quite cool, so you can look at that as well. So uh, anyway, you can have a, a look. There's further information actually about astrophotography uh, in the SLU clubhouse. That's where SLU members hang out. But anyway, that kind of wraps up um, our show here. Uh, at SLU tonight. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank our wonderful guest tonight, Janice Stillman, editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, who helped us understand why the November full moon is known as the beaver moon and just marking the ebb and flow of times as our ancestors did. And that's what we do every month here. We do cover all full moons. We're going to be covering actually all of the different quarter phases as well and new moons to just mark the passage of time as marked by the celestial machinery of the solar system. And of course, we had journalist, author, and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman, join us tonight, who helped us understand the circumstances that have given us this mega beaver full moon tonight and tomorrow night. It's not too late. You can go out in your own backyard to do that. Don't forget, this is the largest full moon in nearly 70 years. This is a great, great event. You get your kids outside, you know, because the best time to view it is the moon rises, the full moon rises when the sun's setting. So your kids will still be up as well, I hope. Now, we hope you've enjoyed the show tonight. You don't have to wait long, though, uh, to do it again. We have another show coming up in just a few days' time. On the 16th of November, we're sitting back in our garden chairs for a night of meteor watching for the Leonid Meteor Shower. So join us at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that's 1 a.m. for Western Europe. We're going to explain how you can photograph meteors from your own backyards. Of course, we have got a whole stack of live image streams and video feeds. We've got our meteor camera at the Canary Islands Observatory, all these special cameras set up uh, to watch these meteors as they stream in live. So that's going to be on the 16th. Uh, we'll also show you how you can even listen to meteors, even if they're behind the clouds, uh, as well as see some of them whizzing across our skies. So we hope you've enjoyed this. We're leaving you with this beautiful image from our Chile Observatory High Magnification Telescope 
of this mega beaver moon. I hope you've uh, you've enjoyed these live image streams tonight. They really have been fabulous. Anyway, I'm Paul Cox. This has been another astronomical production from SLU. Uh, we'll see you very soon, I hope. Bye for now. Good Lord, ride all the way. A ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Hello. Welcome to the end of that massive earthquake in New Zealand. And it's quite often talked about, you know, these mega moons, super moons being linked to earthquakes. So we're going to be talking about that as well. And we're not suggesting this, but do super or mega moons affect human behavior like voting behavior, perhaps? I don't know. And we are also going to tell you the best way of viewing the mega beaver moon tonight and tomorrow night for yourself if you've got clear skies. And then a little bit later, I'm going to be joined by Janice Stillman. Now, Janice is the editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, um, and she's going to be telling us uh, why this particular full moon is called the beaver moon and who gave it that particular name. Now, of course, the stars of the show are our live telescope feeds. Now, I was meant to be broadcasting uh, live uh, from our Knesslu, where there is literally space for everyone. I'm Paul Cox, and tonight we're exploring the mega beaver full moon, live through SLU's telescopes. We partnered with our friends at the Old Farmer's Almanac to bring you a pack show uh, to learn more about this particular full moon. Now, coming up on the show, we'll be welcoming two very special guests tonight. First of all, I'll be joined by a favourite guest of SLU members, Bob Berman, uh, to discuss what makes this a mega moon. That's right, you've heard it here first. This is a mega moon. This is not a super moon. It's a mega moon. And we'll be asking Bob why this is the closest and brightest full moon in nearly 70 years. This really is a special night. Uh, are these events linked to earthquakes? We're going to be answering that question as well because we've obviously uh, heard the news this weekend. Canary Islands Observatory at the Institute of Astrophysics in the Canary Islands. That's a few hundred miles off the west coast of Africa, high on a volcano. But I had to fly back to England earlier this evening. Um, so I had the bonus of actually watching the mega beaver moon rising over the horizon from 35,000 feet. For some reason, this particular photo that I took outside the window is upside down. Not sure my airliner was really doing the kind of aerobatics that I like, but uh, it was a glorious, glorious sight. But we've got a whole stack of live feeds for you tonight. So let's take a quick look back at the one we saw before. This is our panorama. Now, this panorama image is of our Canary Islands 
uh, observatory and it looks like daylight there. You can see the skies are blue and there's a few clouds around. That's actually the nighttime view. That is the view as it is now.